Welcome to this video conversation on living up to promises made, what can accountability achieve for development results. Uh, my name is Matthew Martin and I'm the moderator of this conversation and I'm very happy to be joined on my left by Kompeta Sayenzoga, who is the Permanent Secretary and Secretary to the Treasury in the Ministry of Finance and Economic Planning of Rwanda. On her left, Mr. Saber Hossein Chowdhury MP, who is the Chair of the All-Party Group on Environment and Climate Change in the Bangladeshi Parliament, and Mr. Paul O'Brien, who is the Vice President in Oxfam America for Policy and Campaigns. So we're here to talk about accountability. Sounds like a really boring word. Uh, we've been talking here about why it is really important, because it should allow everybody to be held accountable for delivering development results. Uh, and we've been talking about two types of accountability, if I get it right. One is mutual accountability between developing countries and their aid donors, and the other is domestic accountability, where citizens in both donor and recipient countries can hold each, their governments accountable. We've heard, Kampeta, that you have been very successful in Rwanda in establishing structures for accountability, particularly mutual accountability with your donors. And you've got a very strong aid policy, you've got targets for the individual donors. But can you tell us what is this actually doing for results for your citizens? I think it's doing a lot because what it means is you get more value for money of the money that we receive from donors. So basically, if you have some clear targets as to what the donors are supposed to be doing and how they're supposed to behave, which I think is very important, and you have some quantitative targets to it, it means that for every dollar that you get from a donor, you can squeeze more results out of it. Of course, that assumes that the government systems are producing value for money, that the government systems are actually working for the people. And ensuring that we have mutual accountability means that you have the same value added that you have from government system that now applies to donor funding. So we always talk about donor government being in the driver's seat. It actually buys you the seats. Right. And why is accountability important to parliamentarians? What does it mean to you? Uh, it may be boring, as you say, but I think uh, that is one of the primary functions of a parliamentarian. You know, I mean, why are parliaments there? Um, who is supposed to be the beneficiary of uh, development cooperation? It's the people. Parliamentarians are representatives, elected representatives of the people. And they are the link between uh, who are supposed to be the beneficiaries and who are managing the resources. So I think you know, accountability comes naturally to parliamentarians. And it is why we are there. You know, we are there really to protect the interests of the people mm -hmm. and to make sure that development cooperation is used in an efficient way and the development uh, results are there on the ground. You know, so I think it's a, it's a natural responsibility uh, of a parliamentarian to hold the executive to account. Right. And what about for an international NGO like Oxfam? What, why do you think it's important? Well, we're foolish enough to think it's not boring at all. Um, I, you know, transparency has been the rage uh, in terms of what we've all been talking about. But that, in the end of the day, is fundamentally a technical issue. Accountability is about power. It's about whether you're answerable. And in the end of the day, that's far more important. Who has power? And in our view, the mutual accountability, which we think is important between donors and governments, is actually secondary and a means to a much greater end, which is the kind of a domestic accountability that uh, my two colleagues are talking about. It's those systems internally that are ultimately going to drive the ad development agenda. So the real challenge for us when we talk about mutual accountability on the donor front is how do all of we, donors, NGOs, and others, be relevant and supportive of the much more profound power relationship between a state and its citizens, and the state in all its guises, particularly, I think, parliament these days. Mm. And one of the things we've been talking about here is how do you manage to bring parliament and civil society into these dialogues at national level. What are you doing in Rwanda to try to make this more inclusive, to make sure it's not just a conversation between you and your donors? You know, it's, uh, first we have the Budget Committee of Parliament that has been very vocal and very helpful in reminding the donors that at the end of the day, the Ministry of Finance and the government at large should be accountable to them to the parliament and not to the donors. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a very strong link between mutual accountability and domestic accountability. Because what you're doing with mutual accountability is reminding the donors that give me the money and I will, that will help me achieve what my social contract is with my citizens. And my, my colleague here really put it right. At the end of the day, who is representing the citizens? It is parliament. So it is actually a way of empowering government to be accountable to its domestic accountability mechanisms. And there is no way I can have, let's take the example of Rwanda, which is 40% 
donor funded, the budget is 40% donor funded, how do I go in front of my parliament and say, look, I have a budget of $2 billion, but really just ask me about $1.4 billion because the other $600 million, I have absolutely no idea what's happening to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, we have to see it that way. Is One allows us to actually do the other, and they're directly linked. Mm -hmm. And what we've done is we've really been engaging the budget committee, the public accounts committee, and encouraging them to have direct discussions with donors and with the parliaments, meaning that if I have money that is coming, let's say, from a bilateral, we encourage the parliament to actually discuss these issues with the, the parliament of the donor country and remind them that, look, your government at the executive level has made some commitments in Busan, in Paris, and they're not implementing it. And because of that, the parliament of Rwanda cannot perform its duty as the parliament of country X is currently doing. Mm. And that pressure has been quite useful. Right. Is it? Is it sounds like it's working really well in, in Rwanda. Is it working that well in Bangladesh? And if not, what it, do you need more as parliamentarians to I make sure it, it does? I think it promises to work well mm -hmm. because, you know, for parliamentarians to engage in the process, you know, there are a few prerequisites, if you like. I mean, all aid has to be on budget because if it's not on budget, then it's not subjected to scrutiny. I think that's a challenge that all parliaments face. The other thing is if you don't really have in place an aid policy, so where is the entry point for parliamentarians? What we have in Bangladesh is there is a, a strategic cooperation agreement between the donors and the government. I think parliamentarians are beginning to get involved in the process. Uh, and what we find is, uh, you know, there's a huge capacity constraint issue. Uh, parliamentarians as individuals and parliament as an institution. What sort of information comes to us? You know, we are not trying to take over or assume the role of the executives. I mean, the two are very different roles. And if we are really to perform our role as, of oversight, you know, as a non-executive stakeholder, and I think that's where the focus has to be. So whether it's parliamentarians working in tandem with civil society, you know, the private sector and the others, but of course in the lead, they must have the capacity. They must have the information that's presented to them in an intelligible way. At the moment, I think generally in Bangladesh and elsewhere, parliamentarians are not really up to speed. So if you don't have regular flows of information, if you're not invited to meetings as uh, representing the institution of parliament uh, rather than as an individual MP, then you know, parliamentarians are not going to be able to engage. Mm. Um, it's a new democracy. You know, parliament, I think, is beginning to become more functional. And uh, certainly the hooks are now in place. I mean, aid, aid policy is also being looked into. So I think we can be optimistic as far as Bangladesh is concerned. Right. Paul, I know you've just finished a study about how inclusive mutual, mutual accountability is across the world and whether CSOs and parliaments are really involved. What, what did you conclude? What needs to be done to make sure it becomes more inclusive? Uh, well, we're on a journey. Um, we ourselves as NGOs need to uh, step up and that was one of the, uh, the realizations for us during the course of this, that we need to embrace the accountability transparency mechanisms there and we have stepped up to IATI and uh, signed on to accountability reports. Um, uh, we, give the, we give the accountability process, I don't know, I think the report B minus, it's, it's an, which as an Irish grade is pretty good, I want to say. <laughs> um, uh, it, it, we're, we're all focused on the right things, which is creating the enabling environment for a far more serious discussion at the executive and at the legislative level for genuine uh, understanding and shared agenda around these critical resources. But I just want to add that one of the things that we uh, as Oxfam are really concerned about is this discussion that um, uh, the Honourable Member and the Permanent Secretary are having is the tip of a much larger iceberg because resource flows that are significantly larger than aid are going to drive either the well-being or the destruction of many of these environments. Mm -hmm. A trillion dollars is going to get dug out of Africa's ground in the next 10 years. South Asia has similar opportunities. But it's hard to shape those flows because they don't have the kinds of mechanisms inherently that allow for the kind of public discussion between executive and legislative, between the state and citizens. A does have the ability to create the enabling environment for serious discussions around where's the money going. And if we get it right with aid in these contexts, it could provide that much greater space to look at how citizens can voice their views over private flows, natural resource flows, and these much larger investment flows. So that's why the urgency of this mutual accountability d discussion is, is, is there. And B- minus is good, but it's, it's probably not good enough because it's all going to happen in the next 10 to 15 years. And it would be a lot lower than B- minus for the non-aid flows. 
Oh yes, oh yes. Uh, I mean, the, masses of transactions that people really know very little about, and we're we're I mean, we're currently suing the Obama administration over here to try and be a little bit more um, strong on on making sure American companies have to report on the deals they're making with governments around the world on oil, minerals, and gas. We'd we'd love to see them have the same standards as aid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you've also been very strong in the discussions that have been going on in Paris recently in saying there must be a strong global framework to support what you're doing at national level. Why? Why is that so important? What's the link between global and national? You know, there's a, there's a current practice in aid management which has become almost a tradition of passing the buck to the next person. So when you're in country and you're asking for more mutual accountability, and mutual accountability, what does it mean? It basically, it's supposed to give comfort to donor countries that you're not putting money in a dark hole if you give this money to the government, if you give this money to the recipient countries. And this idea that putting money outside the system is better off because it is safer is actually a fallacy. And this is what we're trying to, to, to encourage everybody to do. But when you ask the donors in country to do it, they say, oh, we can't because headquarter has not, you know, the policies headquarter do not allow us to. And then when you talk to headquarters, they say, oh, yeah, but the country office tells us there's no capacity and, you know, we're funding this. So this is why I call passing the buck. You know, it can go around and it comes back to your table and nothing has changed. What Paris and Busan are actually doing is that it puts a stop to passing the buck because somebody has to sign at the bottom of that declaration to say, I agree this is the right thing to do. And at least I have a document in country in Rwanda when the head of a donor country tells me, oh, sorry, I can't do. I say, well, but your minister of cooperation signed at the bottom and say you're going to do it. So you have to tell me why you're going to do it. It's not up to me to convince you to do it. So it's, the convincing has been done on my behalf in Busan by the heads of state. And my only job is to tell the guy in country, well, explain to me why you can't do it, yet your minister has. And the good thing, the reason why Rwanda is working so well is because of peer pressure. You know, sometimes I'm a bit naughty and I compare donors to kids in a classroom, you know. What works best is not what the teachers say, but what the fellow student is actually doing. And the mutual accountability of Rwanda is actually based on peer pressure. Because we give them marks, you know, green, yellow and, and red, but those are on the internet. Meaning that their minister of cooperation can also know that, you know, your, your head in country tells you this is not possible. But look, donor X has done it. So the problem is not the country, the problem is the sure. guy on the ground. Sure. So transparency and information flow actually breaks a lot of these, mm. these barriers. Right. Mr. Chowdhury, what do you think, looking forward, what do you think the Development Cooperation Forum can contribute to this? You see, I think over the discussions of the last two days, what has really emerged is the necessity of having an aid policy. You know, that's uh, one of the areas where we have uh, tremendous weakness. And if you look at all the countries, only three countries have policies, eight policies, which actually hold the uh, provider country to account as well. So there's a huge opportunity. Now, how do you take it forward? I think one of the areas where the DCF could engage is to have a model eight policy. You know, in Parliament, uh, we are constantly looking at legislation at laws, and we start off with the model legislation and then you try and customize it to your own requirements. So I think the DCF could certainly do that. In terms of having the dialogues, you know, have a country present uh, how these dialogues have actually gone. What have you learned from the dialogues? So I think DCF can be a facilitator. You know, it's ultimately the countries who have to take action. But the, uh, if you can provide those model legislation, those could be very important uh, starting off points for the countries. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's there. The other aspect is, you know, we shouldn't just look at it in terms of uh, how much has been pledged and how much has been dispersed. Uh, you also have to look at the value that uh, disbursement actually brings. Yeah. So what is the development result on the ground? You know, it's like performance budgeting. It's not how much money is allocated and how much money is spent but what is the qualitative impact of spending that money? Yeah. And I think this is where, uh, you know, DCF can also get involved. So well, looking what about at the on your wider investment. agenda yeah. uh, for accountability beyond aid? Well, and on this, this question you asked, you know, the, the thing that, uh, we think that DCF is an increasingly powerful forum. The, uh, the post busan discussions gave us hope that things were going in the right direction, but if we're right that the next five years is critical, and we are in an aid-constrained environment in the next five years too, let's be honest about where we are. Um, it's a little worrying that we're only going to see that post busan discussion convene every 18 months or so. When the, and the question that I would have about the DCF is, what can it do to increase the drumbeat and intensity of discussion around moving the, the wider debate forward more urgently?
So, you know, I've heard a lot of good things at these meeting, at the panels I've been at. Um, I think the discussion is going in the right direction. Is it going fast enough mm -hmm. to meet the needs of particularly the countries that are grappling with this at home? Right. Competa, do you want to add anything on the future way forward? I think things can only be better. Things can only be better because countries are going to perform better. In Africa, we have unprecedented growth. We have unprecedented improvement in indicators. So. I'm fairly optimistic. So you can have more power to hold other people accountable. Definitely. And, and more confidence in being held accountable yourself. Definitely. Yes. Listen, thank you all so much. That's been a great discussion. Uh, it's been a, a pleasure. I, I've got lots of things out of it that I didn't think of before this. Uh, I think that we've all realized just how in, in, inextricably linked mutual and domestic accountability are, how important the global process is, how much all the different stakeholders care about this. So I really hope that there will be a lot of progress in the next few years and that DCF can play a role in, in moving that forward. So thank you very much to all of you and thank you to our, you. our watchers, our viewers, our listeners for joining us for this conversation.